Well, it's a real honor to be here, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this conference, the conference title, uh, the conference content, and as far as I can tell, my job here is to tee it up for those of you who have done the hard work and are uh, presenting your research findings over the next couple of, couple of days. So to do so, I went back and looked at what people tend to say and how they position their thoughts when they're economists or financial economists and they're, they're trying to say something about environmental policy, environmental attitudes, and it seems like there's a template. This isn't exactly a, a new topic. It goes back at least a couple of, of decades. And the template is to acknowledge some environmental problems or ills around the world, ocean acidification, desertification, uh, you know, mainline uh, water and ocean uh, and water and air, I should say, pollution problems. And then to say there are some tools, a couple decades ago it was economists saying there are some good economics tools, and I think now we're starting to say some good tools from the area of financial economics that can address these issues. You know, we think about things such as the organization of productive activity and the agency problem on one end in the corporate finance area to the other, other spectrum of, of thinking about how financial claims are priced, how they're traded in markets, microstructure aspects, and how they affect the value and trading of assets and how the value and trading of assets themselves affect economic development and growth. So hopefully we as a, as a, as a sub-area of economics have something to offer to this area. Having said that, I'd like to not use that template and uh, talk about something different and in so doing get out of my comfort zone into an area that I have no claim at all to any sort of expertise but I'd like to venture anyways and solicit your additions and hopefully not too many corrections. Um, and I'd like to start with a different starting point. And this is, a, this is a graph put together about 20 years ago by a British historian named Ag Angus Madison. It's a compilation of data that allowed him to say something about worldwide GDP per capita over the last 2,000 years. It's a remarkable undertaking when you think about it, but uh, over the last 20 years, this set of data has withstood the, the, the challenges it has uh, received, and there are a couple of noteworthy things about it. First is how flat the line is for the first thousand years, and how it's not that much steeper for the next 800 years or so, and it's not until about 1820 that the line kinks up rather dramatically. And there's a lot of work that has begun to come out about why this is, and none of these, are, I think, are going to be surprises to, to this group. Uh, I've listed some of the key factors here, the, the, the widespread growth of economic and political freedoms following the Renaissance and the political movement and turbulence of the 18th century, uh, increasing stable institutions and property rights, an increased focus on specialization and therefore also exchange facilitated in part through the formation of finance that allowed the growth of joint stock companies, corporations. Um, I'm not even going to go here, however. I'd like to go here, which is to point out that it was at about the same time that we saw the birth of what we now recognize as the environmental movement, particularly in North America, but I think this applies uh, around the world as well. Um, it was in 1836 that Emerson published Nature, 1854 that Thoreau published Walden. And it's no coincidence, I submit, that this birth happened at about the same time as the kink. One reason is, uh, something that I think is also fairly well uh, appreciated and understood, and that is that, uh, that environmental concern, willingness to pay for environmental amenities is an income normal good, and so as societies become wealthier, they're willing to care more in, in real ways for the environment. But I'd like to even so go outside of that area of economic comfort zone and talk about a different reason why uh, this happened at about that king point or shortly thereafter. And that is that uh, to do so, I'd like to, like to make a contrast with uh, some things that I've seen in print not uh, fairly recently. 
it's, it's not uncommon, particularly from the conservative side, to criticize environmental thought, environmental concern, as being the new religion, the 21st century new, new religion. And certainly, in looking at trying to deal with and, and debate some mainstream environmental uh, uh, writers or, or pundits, uh, there are times where I just don't understand where they're coming from and, and their positions seem not rooted in rationality or science, at least to me. So I can understand that critique, but I'd like to take issue with that critique. Not because it's wrong, but precisely because a lot of environmental concern is indeed rooted in at least spiritualism and has a deep connection to, um, to a lot of religious motivation. In fact, Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, treatise on nature is known and noteworthy not only for its statement of what we now think of and can see as a lot of environmental principles that speak to a lot of people today, but it's also the original de definitive statement of transcendentalism, which was itself a reaction to the industrial movement, a protest of the sense that with our increasing wealth and increasing reliance on things and machinery that we as a people were losing some connection to something that was important, something that was at the ground of our being. That's very religious language, I think, to me, or sounds to me. Um, indeed, uh, it was in the middle of the 19th century that the romantic notion of the sublime was a big part of the culture. The sublime, the notion coming from the rom Romantic era, writers such as Immanuel Kant, Edmund Burke, writing about 100 years before this, but by the time of the middle 19th century, there, this was a part of the culture, at least among the literary, uh, or the literate population. Uh, much, like, much like, say, the words internet or holistic might help define our culture today, the sublime was a commonly used term at that time, applied to the notion of greatness, but not necessarily goodness. Um, uh, uh, things that were profound at a deep level, but not necessarily nice or kind. I have to make sure I get this quote right. Writing about this, uh, one of the early romantic writers trying to define the sublime said, it's an agreeable kind of horror. I ran into this in my research on Arctic explorers of the 19th century, in which this notion of searching for the sublime, the experience of the sublime, was a motivation not only for the explorers, but for the population that supported them and followed them, much like um, a century later, uh, uh, astronauts were lionized and followed for going places that everybody else could only go in their imagination. It was an appreciation for the wonders of the unknown world, but also the terrors that those wonders might wreck. These pictures are from past work I've, I've done on, on Arctic explorers. This shows a, a depiction of what happened to the John Franklin expedition, which went into the northern waters seeking a northwest passage in 1848 with 143 people, all of whom were never seen again except, it turns out, by some Inuits. Um, but um, uh, this notion and concern for and drive for a connection to that which is not, other, not us, that which is other, was a major part of the cultural cauldron out of which the transcendentalist wrote and the environmental movement itself was birthed. And it's that cultural cauldron that I'd like to use as a starting point in talking about patron saints and the of the environmental movement. I'm going to talk about three such patron saints and then add a fourth to the list. The three that I'll focus on initially are noteworthy not only for what they did in their own time, but for the fact that their legacies are what we live with today in terms of how many people think of environmental issues, structure, and formulate what the problem is and formulate policy reactions. 